Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. So um, my dad, when I told my dad at three years old I wanted, I wanted to play piano, I saw a photo of it and I heard the music on the radio consistently and I heard that instrument and I singled out that instrument. I, I remember it. And the next thing I know, my dad and some of his friends were struggling to get this big box in the house, which was a Mason and Hamlin upright, which, which would become my, my, uh, my first piano. And um, so it starts from my, my father who listened to me, his son, and, and, made, and made it happen and found me my first, first teacher. Yeah. Why was Martin. piano the first instrument? Um, I heard it, you know, the, my connection comes with the concertos, yeah. you know, the piano playing with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And um, as a solo instrument and playing in, 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 in call and response reaction to the, the orchestra. And um, I think that would, that would be it. Um, I think the first work that really hit me the coining phrase would, would have been um, uh, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, hearing that at, a, at what, age three, you know, that was like incredible, incredible. I still have the same feeling about it this day. Yeah. And, and, and it's looked at as being one of the most difficult pieces to play. Right because of the, the articulations and the, uh, um, the connection between the pianist and the conductor and the orchestra. Now, what was it about that music that would bring you to those 88 keys and to begin to strike them? What was it about that music that lend itself to your approach to your playing in the beginning of uh, your lessons and, and, and your first experience playing piano? Melody. Mm -hmm. Melody. Melody. And um, if you, if, uh, you know, like in, in my early studies, you know, when you're studying earlier forms of classical music, you know, Bach, Brahms, uh, two-part inventions, um, concertos, um, having multiple melodies running at the same time, responding to each other, you know. Um, you know, I think that was it, you know. Melody, melody has to be the key uh, ingredient to what pulled me towards that instrument. You know, and how the piano could ha play multiple melodies simultaneously. Right. You know, you, we have two hands, exactly. eight fingers and two thumbs, <laughs> you know, and, and um, having the ability to have independent independence over them, you know. Um, I think that's what, 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 what drove it to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and... and um, it's one of the most difficult instruments I find to get a sound, to get your own sound. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are a lot of pianists today, and they pick one person to copy over, and it never moves beyond that. Yeah. But all of the great, the, the pianists that I heard that I love, Arthur Rubinstein, um, uh, uh, Horowitz, Vladimir Horowitz. Those were the two contemporaries, uh, Van Cliburn. Yeah, you, you yeah. Know, um, um, they all had unique sounds on the instrument. Rubinstein had his own thing. You know, when he yeah. played uh, glissandos or he played just chord, they, they resonated. Yeah. You know, it was his touch. Uh, also, the composer Rachmaninoff was a incredible pianist you know massive techniques huge hands you know you know one can you know it understandably is the most difficult for people to play his music because 
he wrote stuff that he personally could really play. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And um, having someone to come in and be able to play that at, at that fluidity with small hands must be very difficult. You yeah. Know? What was your major takeaway uh, from uh, the experience with those piano masters? How did, how did you apply a lot what they did into your playing? Well, there's no accidents. You know, the, the, the uh, craft work, the training and the craft work, I had an awful lot of technical training, great teachers, incredible teachers who took a personal interest in, in my, my development. You know, I mean, um, Martha Cambridge was my, my first teacher and she took mm -hmm. me, um, it was, it was I, I was asking more questions than she could answer, so she took me and uh, drove me to Joanna Harris's home. And at that time, they lived in, in uh, Pacific Palisades. Yeah. And uh, in a beautiful home. Her husband was a conductor, Roy Harris composer conductor Roy Harris if you look him up um, he his major contribution is that a lot of his compositional works were based up based off of Native American melodies yeah you know? yeah and um, but it was through Roy and, and Joanna that I got to introduce I met Igor Stravinsky they would throw these soirees and have the students she had uh, eight students I was one of her eight and we would have to perform yeah, and you guests. performed at those events. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 What, what, what did you play? Uh, what um, were your favorite pieces at that time? Uh, oh, there were a lot. Um, as I said, I was mostly into Russian classical mm -hmm. music. You know, uh, I was playing a lot of uh, Bartok. A lot of his works, which are very, very difficult. Alexander Scriabin. You know. Uh, his works are the, some of the most difficult works to play. A lot of dissonance, cluster chords, uh, melodies inside of melodies. Um, but uh, that particular thing, I think I played Pavan. Uh huh. You know, and uh, Debussy. Um, and I talked about Ravel earlier. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I chose works which I, I could totally focus on melody and, and the sound, developing my sound on the yeah. instrument. Yeah. You know, that was important for me to get a sound, get my own sound. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, there were a lot of people when I started to cross over that period where I got interested in the jazz, which is. Another whole story. Um, the pianists I was listening to earlier were were um, Ahmad Jamal. Yeah. And um, believe it or not, Wes Montgomery. Mm-hmm. Because Wes Montgomery played melodies. Right. Exactly. You know, and coming out of a complete uh, playing classical music and switching over to jazz, that transition is very difficult. It was difficult for me. What was the thing that was most difficult? Because you got a little bit ahead of me, and I wanted to uh, uh, segue in. No, no, I wanted yeah. to segue into your experience uh, as a uh, as your approach to jazz, and, and you really gave me a good starting point. And uh, when you mentioned Hama Jamal, I want you to tell me what was the thing about his playing that impressed you the most? His utilization of space. It wasn't overly cluttered. If I could, we could, could compare Bill Evans playing to Ahmad Jamal, mm -hmm. they're both playing in trios settings. Bill Evans would fill up every single space with, with, uh, with a solo performance. Yeah. And there was no... Um, he would never suspend time. Ahmad Jamal could stop and suspend time mm -hmm. in his playing. And uh, he could play incredible uh, melodic solos, but not, not at the degree, at the expense or the degree 
that that uh, Bill Evans would do. And I love Bill. I love the period where Bill played with Miles. Right, right. Because he 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 had to listen more, you know, and and his where he chose to play things, the space that he chose to drop, the chords that he played. Right. You know, showed he had that capability. But I think when you start to play solo, a lot of solo, uh, uh, play a lot of trio, it makes you tend to overplay because you're trying to compensate for the for the fourth instrument that's not there. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I find that being as, as a pianist. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you have to write music or arrange music uh, in a way that would would per would, would would purposely use space in a way that it doesn't u use up all the space, you know. Like if I listen to Nina Simone play the piano and sing, you know, that's a perfect example. The way she got around it was creating a fourth man, which was her voice. Right, right. You know, uh, if you listen to her play Strange Fruit, and you listen to the Base that she's leaving there. You know. You know she she sings the melody, and there's a solid silence in there, and she drops the chord. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And it, it's it's a requiem in, in a sort of way. Most definitely. You know. You know now that we're on the, on the topic of jazz and and you living in Los Angeles in that uh, early 60s period, I would be remiss if I didn't get your impressions of the final days of, or, or the last remnants of what Central Avenue was like in Los Angeles. Oh, well, the person I, I would have to come into mind, and I mentioned earlier before we were taping, was King Pleasure. Yep. You know, and... Um, the man himself, he was a, a, an amazing human being, really. And, and you know, in, in, in one sentence, he would say, he would say, it was the way he talked and talked to you and say things, it was kind of deep. Yeah. Really, really deep. Yeah. You know, um, my impression of him um, and that whole period of, of what was happening in the music, because it was such a short, Central Avenue was not a long stretch. It exactly. Was a, it was a condensed piece of, uh, condensed time that it, it existed. Right. But it was one where, where um, Charlie Parker, you know, right. when he made his trip to West, yeah. you know, that's the area that everybody, that everybody hung. Right. And you know, uh, Bud Powell. But Powell, exactly. The person who I uh, got the best stories from Central Avenue was the late great vocalist Ernie Andrews. Oh, I know Ernie. And I know he, Ernie well too. And yeah. he uh, he told some wonderful stories about all yeah. the nightclubs on Central Avenue. Phineas Newborn and Phineas Newborn Jr. Yeah, as, as well. Yeah. 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 So you 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 saw the last days of, the, of the, that period. The very last days of it. You know, I mean, look, we had to watch Riot in, what, 64? That's right. It was 64. That was the end of Central Avenue. Yeah, yeah. That's what ended it. The watch riots changed everything. Changed everything. Well, it changed all, almost every major city in America. Living in L.A., yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> you know, that, that was, well, I only thought that that was happening there, you know. The, the day that the Watts riot hit, my, my dad had just, a month earlier, my dad had bought this piece of property over in Watts, and it was right directly across from Wrigley Field, which uh -huh. was an old baseball stadium. And um, we were in there painting and patching holes up in the wall, and, 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 and my dad was doing sca scaffolding because they, they were using sheetrock back then. Yeah. You know. Yep. So you you had to do the the concrete work. That's right. In there, That's against right. the wall. So it was my me, and both of my cousins, Mark and Dwayne. Mark is my my oldest cousin, and and my and my and my dad. So there were four of us, and 
we took a break. My dad went out to go get some food. And when we walked outside, we saw the smoke in the distance. You know, as far as you can see, stuff was burning up. And um, my dad, when he came back, he told us to get in the, in the car and, and uh, we were going. Yeah. And we lived way on the west side. We yeah. lived, we lived uh, in the Crenshaw district. That's considered to be the, the west side right. of L.A. When we got to Vermont, the, the National Guard, the military, had everything blocked off. There were tanks in the street. We couldn't, we couldn't cross. Yeah. And yeah. my dad had a military ID. It was security clearance, and they wouldn't let him through. And um, he called some someone. It took us. We had to sleep overnight in in the house on a yeah, yeah. on a on a hard floor, no carpet. Yeah, you know, I went through uh, pretty much the same thing that summer of 1964, when a police officer shot a young man, and uh, and a rebellion came uh, right down my street. You know, I lived on East 125th Street, and the rebellion came right down it was like uh, same year in in the summer of 1964. wow yeah yeah wow man so well, they, you know that's what happened in la they that's shot, what they happened shot. in la yeah yeah a few years later you know whether it was detroit or uh, philadelphia washington dc uh newark new jersey and uh those riots or rebellion whatever you want to call them at the time uh really changed the face Listen, you know, those entire for 30 years, they put no money, not a single tax dollar went into Watts. Yeah. Not to, there was no money to rebuild anything. They left it exactly. The, they were burned out buildings for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. You know? So in, and, your, and, in your experience during that time, where did the music scene move to? particularly the jazz music scene? Well, believe it or not, L.A. had al always had a diverse jazz music scene. Mm -hmm. Problem was, there weren't, there weren't a lot of places for musicians to work. Right. Or, or to, to work. Uh, the, we only had one place where, at that time, that I grew up, where musicians could, could go and sit in. And that was uh, Larry Gales, Mm -hmm. play, bass player who played with Monk. Yep, yeah. He had a jazz club, and that's where everybody would go. It was after hours. They would run to four or five o'clock in the morning, and um, you know you would have everybody. The mother would come through there and play Dizzy, Freddie Hubbard, Herbie, um, Buster Williams lived there at that time. Yeah. He was playing with the Jazz Messengers, off and on, and sometimes with Bobby Hutchison. Um, you had a lot of great musicians, and the only place where they could go and play, that was the only place. Right. You know? Um, there was no, um, there was one place I remember that uh, uh, Chico Hamilton told me about that I should come by, but the uh, cops raided it one night for drugs, and they completely shut it down. Yeah. And uh, I got to mention one place, Monty's on the Hill. Yeah. You told me that story. Yeah, yeah. Incredible story. It, it, he was the guy, the first guy that I knew of in my, in my lifetime um, that owned, that built, designed, built his own jazz club. And it was, it was right off of La Cienega, and I think the top of La Tierra, La Cienega, at the top of the hill, when you're going over the hill to go towards LAX, um, there was this street, I think Stalker ran into that, and at the top of that hill, there was this club. It looked like it was a flying saucer. Mm. You know, it was, it was circular. That was, that was Monty's on the hill. And, and basically, Miles Davis opened the club. He came there and played with, with Herbie, and... Um, in the band with Herbie, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter, and Tony Williams, yeah, uh, played there, and it, it was only in existence for less than a year, and the cops again shut it down. They claimed it was drugs in, they, and they 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 firebombed it. What was the environment that 
made it uh, a place that would limit amount of clubs. You would think that if there were two clubs, five clubs segregation would make, would make it a destination. Segregation. Yeah. One um the the uh there was a curfew. They didn't like anything to go past twelve midnight. Yeah. You know, even for for a lot of the white clubs it was different difficult. You know, they get they were equally on it, but there were they got around it in some ways. Um um I know there was a monopoly that they didn't want any any black clubs to outshine what they were doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, you had uh, Shelley's Manhole and the Lighthouse were owned by one person, a Hasidic Jew, Rudy. Mm hmm You know, and uh, I forget his, his, his Hebrew name, but Rudy 